A lot of people ask, what's the difference between the experience using a static case study and a simulation? Case studies have their place, taking a look at something that happened within your organization, your industry, or your job function in the past, and then evaluating and discussing the situation, the choices made, and the implications is an important learning tool both for students and professionals. But simulations are a little bit different. The point of a simulation is to create a situation where people are experiencing a world that is artificial, but it feels authentic enough for them to get into the storyline and participate as if they were there. Think about it like this. Case studies are a lot like old games like Donkey Kong. As a player, you got to run along and interact and react to what was happening. However, everything that happened was scripted and your participation was just about reacting well. On the other hand, simulations are more like open world games. Games like Grand Theft Auto, Fallout, or even the World of Warcraft, where there's some rules, there's some directives that come up, but the player is free to create their own experiences, make independent decisions, and those decisions ultimately affect what happens in their gameplay. Not only are simulations generally more interesting and enjoyable, but there's also a greater potential for learning and development. The research on simulation-based learning and skill development establishes a number of skills or learning benefits from simulation-based education. The critical point of comparison in all these cases are traditional learning models with lectures, seminars, and case studies. Most of the relevant research is finding that simulations are very effective for tangible and intangible skill development. We'll come back to the tangible skills, but let's take a minute to talk about the intangible skills. You may be more familiar with intangible skills as soft skills. It used to be that we emphasize these pretty much only in business management and communications. However, there is increasing evidence that one of the big differentiators for career success between professionals in any field are these intangible skills. For example, in 2018, Google published the results of their own in-house study about what characteristics that their most successful employees had, and it didn't matter whether they were technical specialists or not, it was all about soft skills, like mentoring behaviors, good communication and listening skills, social awareness, empathy, teamwork, critical thinking, problem solving, and connecting complex ideas. These findings even surprised Google. It wasn't at all what they were expecting, but it also explains why simulation-based learning is so successful and in being increasingly used in executive MBA programs, in fields like accounting, and certainly in my own field of crisis communication, because the findings are clear. Simulations immerse participants in an authentic experience that requires them to engage in a realistic environment where they have to interact, hear alternative viewpoints, make decisions, and really focus on high order thinking skills. Think about it this way. The hard sciences have known for a long time that running computer-based models and simulations was critical for testing theory before putting theory into practice. That's what simulations can do for soft skills. It's like running a model, it's just one for people. There are two cases to be made for simulation-based learning. The first is the business case. The fact of the matter is that simulations are increasingly being used as part of the interviewing process, often in day-long assessment centers. And why not? After having run simulations in my own classes and with professionals for the last several years, I can certainly tell you after a day of watching them who I'd hire and who I wouldn't, not only based on how well they actually do the job, but also based on how they would fit into a team and high pressure environment. Second, simulations improve the hard and soft skills and we'll get more into the theory and research on that. Third, having experience in simulations is also being reported as an emerging employability asset for new graduates. The second case for simulation-based learning is the applied case. And this solves the age-old question, which came first, the skill or the experience? The fact is core knowledge has to come first. You don't develop new conceptual knowledge in simulations, but what you do is apply it. 
This means that simulations create a relatively safe space for practicing decision making and experiencing stress. Think about it this way. Why don't car companies release new models without safety tests and inspections? It's because they're unproven and they wouldn't know what would happen if they were put into a stress test. The same is true for people. The problem is that people get caught in a catch-22 situation where they can't get experience without having experience. Simulations help to reduce this problem for employees, clients, and organizations. What this allows is for people to apply theory to practice. This is why I say that it's not where people learn about the topics, but it's their laboratory setting for testing them out. As a result, it improves preparedness for a variety of situations. Really, there are a few limitations on the simulation experience, and most of those are going to be down to the creativity and developmental abilities of folks creating the simulations themselves. Let's take a look at why simulations are successful tools for skill development. Now, if you're interested in all the work that's grounded this approach, you can take a look at the theories informing it. But the skill-centered immersive learning development model, or skilled model for short, is based on the confluence of models for gamification, persuasion, and learning. But let's cut to the chase. The model's core assumption is that what drives us as learners in any context are four factors that enable and sometimes inhibit our ability to acquire new skills or improve the skills we already have. I like the metaphor of a person. If we think about our skills, they're our legs. They get us from place to place, but they are just part of the rest of the person. Driving everything we do is our head. We've all sat through classes at every level of education or professional development thinking to ourselves, this just isn't relevant. But we were there because we had to be. The fact of the matter is that for people to be interested in learning and skill development, it takes work. And to do the work, we have to feel like it's relevant to us, our jobs, our careers, or our interests. Well-crafted simulations make it easier for people to see the connections between what they do or want and the skills, theory, or ideas they learn about in the classrooms, training events, or on their own. They make it easier to get people's heads into the situation because they are immersive. Simulations tell stories and people get into stories and storylines. It's this point about good stories that leads into the second factor, fantasy. Now, if you're a gamer, think about a game that you've really gotten into, or if you're an obsessive box set watcher, reality TV, Basically, think about things you've ever gotten into and probably spent way too much time on. They're satisfying in some way. Likewise, for any kind of a learning experience to be successful, people have to feel like they're getting something valuable out of the experience. Of course, the value could be in the skill development. That's why people get obsessed with music, sports, esports, and the like. But for most people, the overall satisfaction is the feeling that we have done something interesting. Simulations target this level of emotional engagement with the learning process because they suck people into the moment, into the experience itself. At the end of a good simulation, people will tell you they couldn't believe how completely immersed they were. It felt like they were really at work, experiencing everything that happened throughout the day. And by the way, achieving this level of satisfaction is a lot easier when we have the right tools that let us connect our multimedia, complex work environments in a way that's really similar to how people work every day. That's what a good simulation platform does. It makes creating fantasy a heck of a lot easier. With your simulation, you're creating a world and a story that hopefully builds curiosity. But we have all seen boring movies, so we want to make sure that we don't create a boring simulation. If the story is going to hold people's attention, that needs to be a good one, especially if we're talking about full day simulations. You need to think about plot twists, the unexpected, and how the story is going to develop. Now, let me know, make a note here. Good storytelling isn't about the threat of global destruction. Certainly big explosions and car chases are exciting, but let's face it, most of our work lives aren't about averting global destruction. 
Curiosity has to be realistic or authentic within the world that you've created. Here's the cool thing. You can create any world you want, but it needs to be a world that works within the rules that you have created for it. The final element of the skilled model focuses on control. It's not going to surprise you that when it comes to skill development, people don't like doing things that they're terrible at. The worse they are, the more they know it's going to be a really hard road to improve. And ultimately, if they don't believe that it's going to do any good or that becoming proficient just won't matter, guess what? They're not even going to try. This is how we protect our sense of self. If we think we're hopeless or that doing something won't matter, why go through the pain of trying and failing? This is how we control our time, our sense of self, and how we make judgments about what we can and should be doing. This is the reason it's the heart of the model. Without ensuring that people feel like they have control, they're not going to care about new skills. What's interesting, though, about this is that even if people feel pretty badly about their own abilities, this can be improved through rehearsal and reinforcement. And this is what simulations really target, getting people to rehearse, applying new skills, getting feedback on their performance, and then practicing more and more. We know this works and, and that this control concept is based on the concept of efficacy. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about efficacy, not just because it's what drives the success of simulation-based learning, but also because it's a concept that I think if more people understood, they would really be better off as parents, teachers, and managers. Albert Bandura is a social psychologist who was particularly interested in how people learned. He developed social cognitive theory that basically says how able people are to learn something new will be based on who they are, how they behave, and certain constraints from the world around them. But what was particularly revolutionary about Bandura's research was this concept of efficacy. Efficacy is our belief in our ability to perform a specific action and a prediction of what we think will happen when we perform that action. Why does efficacy matter? There are three reasons that have been found really consistently over the last 40 years or so. First, it governs our choices about behavior. Think about it this way. If we have our choice between doing something that we're really good at and comfortable doing versus something we think we're really bad at and frustrates us, most of the time we're gonna choose the activity we're good at. This doesn't necessarily mean we're making the best choice, but it's certainly the choice that's safest. Second, it also means that it influences our motivations to act. For example, when non-voters are act why they didn't vote in a particular election, the single most common reason offered is that they simply don't think their vote will matter. Third, if we believe we're not going to ever be good at something or that it just doesn't matter, guess what, we're right. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The point is that people's attitudes about new skills need to be positive. When they aren't, they're not actually going to work to improve them. And psychologically, this makes sense. No one likes to feel like they're bad at something or that activities are futile. But when it comes to career and employee development, when asking why employees don't improve their skill sets to make them more employable, a lot of the time the response is that they just don't see the point. The good news is we can target efficacy attitudes and by changing them actually not only improve people's attitudes but their ability to develop new skills. And this is where we come back to the chicken and egg argument. How do people get experience without previous experience? Targeting efficacy solves this problem in four different ways that are applicable to simulation-based learning. First, by practicing the behaviors and skills we just get better. This is the mastery experience. What research has found is that we don't actually have to perform these tasks in real life, we can practice. This is why any athlete will tell you that practice is vital. Of course, real game time also improves people's skills, but without practice, the athlete's not getting to the game. This is what simulations do for the rest of us who don't make our livings as professional athletes. They give us practice. 
Second, social modeling focuses on breaking down a desirable behavior or skill into a process. What's step one that needs to be accomplished? What's step two? And so on. This breaks down complex new skills and learning into much more digestible chunks that people feel like they can master. Simulations let us highlight and focus on either particular steps or the overall process. Third, providing practice improves people's ability to put new skills into action. Most people have some level of anxiety about new skills and new situations because they want to perform well. Unfortunately, for some people, this can also be overwhelming. And research shows that with this type of practice, the type they get in a quality simulation, it actually improves their physical and emotional states so they can better focus on the behaviors they're trying to enact. Finally, feedback is necessary, and it's a part of the simulation experience. When we create learning experiences that provide encouragement, even when people mistakes, then people feel much more confident about enacting new behaviors. If people are engaged and immersed in the simulation, which like I talked about means getting them interested, creating a great storyline, then you can accomplish just about anything you want. People are actually pretty eager to suspend their disbelief, but what I've found is that the more that it feels like a working environment, more authentic, the better. This is why any good simulation platform needs to look and feel much like it would be in a real organizational environment where people have access to emails, to the types of folders and documents that they would typically have in a workday. And this is what lets us create a great storyline. It means that we can use any program or app that's used in the job, that people can interact with each other, and it looks like the office environment, but we also should be flexible to use it in the field so that people could connect to the simulation even if they weren't in an office, because let's face it, not all of us work in regular office environments. There is one caveat though. In my research on simulations, what I've found is that the experience works a lot better when people feel good about the organization itself. So if you're doing this within your own organization's environment, it will be far more effective if you have a great corporate culture or people see the simulation environment as a way to build a great corporate culture. If you're creating a simulation where the organization is flexible, then the top tip is to create or use a socially responsible and likable organization. Since we're talking about creating a great simulation experience, what I've found with my own research on simulation effectiveness is that what people assume going into a simulation experience is often very different and not nearly as good as what they actually get out of the experience. So let's take a look at what participants have found to be the most challenging aspects of simulations. Going in, they're often worried about bad team dynamics. As a matter of fact, this occupies most of their stress and apprehension before a simulation. What they find coming out is that by working with others to solve a collective problem isn't that challenging. What simulations do is improve participants' attitudes about team collaborations. What also seems to happen during their first simulation experience is the participants feel fairly overwhelmed by the pressure of the new skills and the experience, and that's not something they anticipate going into the simulation. Yet with each successive simulation experience, they become more confident in handling that pressure. But then what they also find is that they underestimate the amount of information that they need to make good choices or key recommendations in pressure situations. So the more pressure they feel, the more times they do this, then the more effectively we can begin to introduce strategies to them for making better decisions with the simulation experiences themselves. And we know this because when participants identified the best aspects of the simulation experience, they focus on the transferable knowledge they developed, skills they practiced, confronting pressure, and a good team experience. 
What's telling to me about the value and the power of the simulation experience is that few, if any, participants anticipate having an interesting professional experience going into a simulation, yet a third of them say that that was one of the best aspects of the experience coming out of the simulation. Over the years, I've collected a lot of reflections on the simulation experience, but there are a couple of key themes that come up in the comments that participants make. The first one is about the importance of transferable skills that they feel they get to practice. This is coming from participants at all career levels, from new professionals all the way up through C-level executives. The second consistent reflection focuses on the fact that participants get to practice their skills in pressurized contexts that feel real. When we come back to this concept of efficacy that I talked about, the control part of the skill model, what we see in the simulation reports, both the quantitative and the qualitative data, is a consistent story that simulations effectively target people's belief in their ability to enact both hard and soft skills. It also explains why more and more organizations are beginning to adopt simulation-based approaches to training and education. It's an effective tool for people after they've learned a new skill, but haven't had the chance to prove it. The applications of this in organizations from educational settings to the hiring process and all the way through improving technical and executive decision-making are wide open. Simulation experiences improve employee, and organizational capacity.